Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, who it was a it was a race. Oh, we're see you see how it's showing ah. the wrong thing. Everybody, wait, wait. This is not Brian Larue. This is, in fact, Colby Fayok. What's up, Colby? How you doing? I'm good. How about yourself? <laughs> Just slightly panicking. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, so I um, I realized like five minutes before we went live that I had broken my website and my website is also the API that powers these overlays. So I had to fix my website so that the API would work so that the web, the overlays would show the right thing. It was a race to the finish, uh, but we got there only two minutes Success. late. Whew, we did it. So Colby. It is, uh, it's so good to have you on the show. I feel like we, uh, you, this is your first time on the show, right? I, I've been on before. I think it was at Apple tools or something That's like that. That's right. It's, it's, we did it's testing. Been a minute. It's been a yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're going to talk, we're going to talk about images today, but before we do that, let's talk about you. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar, you want to give us a background? Sure. So I'm Colby Fayok. I'm, I'm a developer experience engineer over at Clownery, uh, which is an image and video platform. Um, so I do things like code, content creation, uh, kind of similar stuff to what you do, um, but for Clownery. Um, mm. But that's me in a bubble. <laughs> um, yes. And, uh, and, and so today we're, we're going to dig into Cloudinary, which, you know, Cloudinary is a, is a huge player in my in my tool belt, like my, what, you know, whatever my arrow in my quiver, whatever it is you want to say as a, a developer, I use it for everything. Um, in fact, the, the placeholder video or the placeholder image that shows up when the stream first starts, that is automatically generated by Cloudinary using the, my API, the thing that I broke today. Um, the, uh, that those are Cloudinary images. And so if you go to any episode of my show on learnwithjason.dev and add slash poster.jpg to the end, it will use Cloudinary to generate a, an image, right? And so this is all the, all of this is stuff that I have to um, very carefully uh, automate because I, there's no way I have enough time to do it on my own. Right. Totally. And th this is where I find Cloudinary to be magic because I always need custom something. Like I, I want to stick somebody's face onto it. I want to show who the, the current author is. I want to do something like that to make this thing feel personalized, to make it feel like it's not just me copy pasting the same default open graph image every time I share a link or whatever it is. And I've, I've just found that Cloudinary helps me solve this huge category of problems very quickly. Um, and in, I'm pretty sure I'm still on the free tier. So it's a, it's a <laughs> it's massively, generous. it's a massively powerful tool with a really generous free tier. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I got paid to say none of that, actually. <laughs> that's, that's just how I feel. So um, really appreciate it. We'll send the swag to your house. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so Colby, tell me, um, like, I, you know, obviously I'm very familiar with Cloudinary and, and I love it a lot, but for folks who are maybe hearing about it for the first time or who have only seen it used in one or two applications, do you want to give the, the high level of what Cloudinary is? Yeah, so uh, I've been traveling a lot, so I've been practicing this a little bit, but uh, we're a, a image and video uh, platform for developers. So everything from asset management to delivery. Um, so from asset management, it can range from the developer oriented stuff, like just simply uploading programmatically, or it can work with creatives where imagine you want to have one source image from the creative team, maybe a photographer, mm -hmm. where from there you can programmatically do a ton of different stuff with that image or video, such as crop it dynamically, or just simply resize it. Responsive images, for instance, mm -hmm. comes in very helpful for that. Um, you could also do transformations like background removal, color replacement, a lot of interesting things. And uh, it was funny that I think TechCrunch kind of coined it as like a Photoshop API or something like that. Um, mm. Because you're basically able to programmatically do Photoshop like things, right? Like your cards, right? That's something that you can do with the, with the code based API that might typically find somebody doing a Photoshop or now. Mm -hmm nowadays might be figma or something right well that, that's actually what um what i was doing before uh i mean this is a, a very real use case that that kind of illustrates your point i so the way that learn with jason worked before 
is um, I the only way I can run the show is I have an assistant. I have uh, an administrative assistant who helps me with scheduling and and putting stuff up on like YouTube and learn with Jason Dev. And um, without that, my world would crumble. And what I used to have is I had a, a Figma template and I had set up like symbols in in Figma where there was like this is the guest image and this is the text and this is the thing. And so go in here and like put the guest image in this box and then type the title of the episode in this box and put the date in this box. And then I would update a bunch of composed like placeholders for the schedule for the, there was like a coming soon. Um, there is a, there was like a scheduled image, a coming soon or a starting soon image. And then like a, this has already happened. This is the poster for the replay image. Um, as well as like a, a guest thumbnail that had their name below it and just a, a bunch of things that I needed to exist. And so my my assistant would have to go into Figma and manually drop these things in and then also go into, I use Sanity as the CMS for Learn With Jason. They'd have to go in there and upload it there. And so it was a lot of content entry that, you know, there's opportunities for things to get wrong every once in a while I would notice because, you know, this, this isn't somebody who's in tech. This is just somebody who, who, you know, they, they took an, uh, an administrative assistant job. And so mm -hmm. the wrong person's face would show up in an image and they don't know better because like, you know, it's, <laughs> they've never human, met any of right? these folks <laughs> um, or, or they wouldn't know how to spell a, a framework that's got some interesting spelling. And so you'd see like a miscapitalization of WordPress or something. And then I have to go in and I have to fix it. And, and so it was this, the stuff that was, um, it was just labor. And so then when I figured out that I could solve this with Cloudinary, I took my template out of Figma, put it into Cloudinary as a blank template, and then uploaded my custom fonts. And I hooked it up to the Sanity API. So now I have a serverless function that calls my API to get the episode detail and the, the link to the, the guest headshot, the title of the episode. And then it uses the template and it puts the text in the right place, shows the right date, puts the guest name on, and then uh, uses the the URL of their thumbnail to like put a layer in underneath the template so that I, it, and it's all, you know, I, it was like quite, a, it's a lot of layers. So it took me a little while to get it set up, but once I got it set yeah. up, it's like, I've never had to touch it since it just works. Um, it's and beautiful. It probably cut 30 minutes a day out of my, my EA's uh, workflow. Yeah, and I'm, I would imagine like that also includes different sizes and stuff too, right? Like mm -hmm. um, not just of the same image, but you probably have different formats depending on where that image is being used, right? Right. Um, so being able to have that all, and imagine like cloning all those different ones, and um, and now you can just do that all programmatically from the data source. Exactly. I mean, it's it's such a it's such a game changer, you know, to to figure out that like it is, especially as like I I like to do design but it's not my job anymore. And I don't have the time to like dive in and really get after this. Right. So being able yeah. to get a design that I like once, and then I'm not in Figma where I have that temptation to tweak this or change <laughs> it, or maybe I'll try yeah. a different color today. And then I've wasted two hours and I'm like staying up late to finish the work I was actually supposed to do. Um, right. that, that has been really big. I feel like that automation when you've got these tasks that they're, they're simple, and they don't take that much time, but they have a lot of temptation or they just have a lot of like wiggle room for human error. That stuff mm -hmm. is so important to automate out of the way because the way I do my thumbnails changes at most once a year. Like I don't rebrand learn with Jason that often. So the thumbnails that I've been using now, I think are two years old. I'm think I'm starting to entertain the idea of doing another one, but especially when after I talking make the about change, <laughs> well, here's the other thing that's really exciting when I make the change. I'm going to automatically rebrand every mm -hmm. other episode that I've ever recorded because it's just from the Figma template. So I'm going to update that template in Cloudinary and all of my images are going to update all at once with the right information, all that stuff, because it's it's programmatically generated. I don't have to go back and replace 300 and however many episodes now with new thumbnails. Like, oh yeah. my God, that's huge. <laughs> that's a lot of time. Yeah. Yes. That's it, that's fantastic. And it's amazing how like this is just a one single use case, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's already saved you so much time compared to all the other things you're doing on the web. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's it really is just kind of a, a it's it. 
I feel like Cloudinary is one of those services. There, there's this category of services that I, I have started to think of as like the great equalizers, where it, it allows somebody who is a, a team of one to do things that are competitive with massive mm. teams. Um, and so, you know, Cloudinary is one of them because of all that I just described. Uh, I think of, of serverless functions like Netlify and, and Netlify functions is another one because I don't have to stand up a server. I don't have to figure out how to write an express boilerplate. I just write some business logic and I'm off to the races, you know, get pushed to deploy. Um, and there's, there's just a suite of services that I heavily rely on and they just help me automate so many things that I I've started thinking of as, um, like I, the, I, I've been saying this and I've been thinking, wondering whether or not it's, it's like too dismissive, but I, what I call undifferentiated labor. And, and what I mean by that is like, when I do the work to copy paste the title and the guest image into a thumbnail, that is not, I'm not generating value. I'm mm -hmm. following a process that I, I generated the value when I decided that thumbnails would look like this and they would communicate this information and they would live on my website. Doing it manually every time is, is just rote process, copy, paste, copy, paste, save. And that is undifferentiated. That's not, it's not adding value. It's not making anything better. It's just time. And the same with like, if I have to go copy paste the boilerplate for an express server every single time I want to do a little bit of logic, that's just time. Like your express server doesn't get better or worse because you've written it by hand. It's just a router at the end of the day. And so I need a request to go into this, to do a little bit of server logic and then return a value. And a serverless function just lets me do that with no DevOps, with no boilerplate. And, and so that undifferentiated part, the thing that's the same for every project just disappears. Yeah, and that, th that, that I, I felt the same exact way with uh, Netlify when I first saw it and not to just throw back the love to Netlify, <laughs> but um, like when I, cause I came from a contracting shop and we had like Jenkins for every setup where mm. you did all the AWS cloud formation stuff. And the first time I deployed a site on Netlify, I was just like, I can do all this stuff. That's not unique to me uh, super easily and just get my stuff out on the web. Right. So um, it's that removing that stuff that's not unique. So to, to ultimately make us more productive and focus on those unique problems. Yeah. I mean, the, the goal of all of this, right, is we have a business because we think we can make something valuable and our time should be spent on building the value, not on building the, the scaffolding that enables that value. Um, so whenever I find a tool that removes a layer of, of boilerplate, you know, it's like, hey, now all of my, t you know, I spend probably on a given day on any day that I actually get to do engineering work anymore, which is not very many days. But when I do engineering work, the vast, vast majority of my time is now spent on building, building the value of the idea. Yeah. Cause you know, you can get the, the concept out of my head, like my boilerplate. I've deployed my hello world in about three minutes because you just create a folder, hook it up to Git, and you're deployed. Okay. Now everything else that you do is, is building the value. You're no longer messing with boilerplate. It's, it's an exciting time to be a developer in this space Absolutely, uh, because of all those tools we have. So speaking of tools and, uh, and how nice it is to be alive, you, you have built something. Um, so let's, uh, as a, as a little bit of context setting here. So, um, Cloudinary has a URL based API that I love. And then it also has like a node SDK, which is sort of a JavaScript based object, uh, config driven API. Um, and a lot of people are using Cloudinary to power a lot of different sites. We're seeing Next.js kind of emerge as one of the, the leading frameworks if you're building complex like dashboard style or app style apps. Um, and you have built something that gives, it's, if I'm understanding correctly, it is a Next.js library for using the Cloudinary SDK. Is that right? Yeah. So what I was attempting to do um, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel that was already existing there because the Next.js team did a fantastic job with the image component. Mm -hmm. But so thinking before Next.js 13, that changed a few things. But before Next.js 13, we had a Cloudinary loader. It was super basic. It had a few things, um, but it didn't really do a ton of things that Cloudinary can do, like overlays, for instance. Um, now, after Next.js 13, they don't even have 
the, that Cloudinary loader built in. I don't think they have any loaders built in. You also have to attach them individually to every single instance of the image tag. Mm. So there's a lot of complicated pieces there if you want to use uh, more Cloudinary tech, right? Um, so I didn't know that specific change was coming. So it just kind of set myself up uh, really well for this. Mm. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm taking that core image component that works really well. I'm wrapping it with a custom loader that also extends it with more Cloudinary features. So one example of that is um, you can use the sizes prop just the same as you would with the image tag because those features still exist, but it uses Cloudinary URLs, right? Oh. Um, but extending that, now you can add a remove background prop and that'll remove the background from the image using on the fly uh, processing. So like it's able to have that core amazingness, but just take it way beyond with all the Cloudinary features that we know right. and love. No, that's great. That's that's really great. Um, so I think what we probably want to do here is, uh, I, I mean, is there is there any sort of abstract or sort of like philosophical underpinning of of this that we haven't talked about um, before we jump right into the code? Um, so I, I guess really the only thing that I was trying to do was make the API, the props API a little bit more intuitive for so the the cloudinary sdks and apis can do a lot of really awesome things but mm -hmm. they're they're very specific things right like i can very finely tune all the different attributes of an image but i wanted to make it a little bit more intuitive so like you're basically expressing what you want to do mm -hmm. and you then have that ability so um i think that's really the only thing um i'd like to also abstract this and put it in other frameworks but my first release with it was next.js Gotcha. 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 Yeah. And, and, you know, I think like I have, I have found, I always want to bring uh cloudinary in for my, my sites because there are a few things that I have to do every single time that I hate doing. When I write a blog post, I know that I'm going to put a screenshot in there and that screenshot is probably going to be a PNG because that's what Mac does by default. And I know that it's going to be not optimized because if I don't take it to something like tiny PNG, um, I'm just getting whatever the Mac gives me. And I like more manual labor, it, right? It's, it's just these little things that you have to do every time. But then even beyond that, I know that I'm using edge. A lot of people are using Chrome and they can handle WebP or Avif or all these modern formats that are way smaller than a PNG. And I know that if I'm doing my job right, I've added a source set so that on my iPhone, I'm getting an image at the appropriate resolution for the iPhone. And on my desktop, I'm getting the full, you know, the full resolution screenshot with all the details um, so that I'm not wasting bandwidth. So, and, and also, I just don't want like the bandwidth charges. It is, yeah. it's really like if you have a post take off and you've got a, an uncompressed PNG or like an animated GIF or something that is, you know, eight megabytes it is kind of staggering how quickly you'll burn through bandwidth. It's funny, um, I never thought about it from that perspective. Like that's, that's absolutely true. Like you're saving yourself money by yes. opting into that optimization, right? You want to keep your free tier stuff on the free tier, like find these ways to shave off bytes and bandwidth, because that's what companies end up charging for is, is usage yeah. basically. So use less. And, and so whenever I'm like, if I'm building a next site, I'm building a, an 11 D site, whatever it is, I'm going to try to find a way to get cloudinary to automatically send the right format of image to send the, the source set of, you know, the five sizes that I want to send for different resolutions. Um, because I don't ever want to manually create a, a source set or, yeah. you know, and, and I don't even, I, honestly, like I understand in the abstract how content type negotiation works. I don't think I could build it. Like I have no idea exactly what I would do to, to get a request for a PNG, but send back a web P if the browser supported it. Like, yeah, I sort, I sort of under, I know that the browsers let the request know I accept these sorts of things and that we can do some middleware. And that's kind of what Cloudinary is doing in magic. Um, but I don't want to build that. That sounds terrible. <laughs> right? Yeah, so right. given, given the option of like, if I can't use Cloudinary, I just don't do that thing, which means that I'm using more bandwidth. I'm wasting my, my user's bandwidth when they're loading it on a phone and they're getting the full size PNG and, instead of an optimized version. It's just bad for everybody. And one, it, like, there are a lot of things that I really like about Next.js. One of them that I actually kind of struggle with a little bit is the image component. 
because okay. I've, I've found it to be prescriptive to the point of being kind of hard to use. And okay. when I want to plug it into Cloudinary, cause I don't want every, I don't want every image call to be running through like that's bandwidth. That's a lot of like processing yeah. and bandwidth that we're using to like process these images on the fly. I want it to be done through Cloudinary because I know that when Cloudinary does it, I have the proof it's optimized once and then served from the cache. And that means that my bandwidth use is way lower. Um, and I know that Cloudinary is optimized for, for asset serving. So the, the free tier is designed to handle that bandwidth, right? Yeah. So the idea of having something that automates this for me, because every single time I've done this on Next.js, I'm, and I haven't even tried it on Next 13, I didn't realize they removed the, the Cloudinary plugin because, man, what a bummer yeah. that is. That was like... <laughs> But that tripped me up too, because you'd start using image and then you'd like, tr you'd like do the cloudinary thing and it would break. And then you're like in the config yeah. trying to remember how to turn that on. Um, it was also always a little bit confusing to use it as well. So I, um, especially like having to the different options. So like now you can technically white, whitelist the, or add to the allow list, the, mm. um, the URL, but you're not really gaining those benefits ultimately. And it's still going through that next JS pipeline. Right. It, it, exactly that. Right. Like it, it just it, I felt like I was giving up one of the, the strongest tools in my belt and kind of getting locked into this thing that was, you know, at, at the end of the day, like, you know, the, it, it does feel like a lot of next features are kind of being designed to drive you to a single platform. That's that they want you to pay them. Right. Of course. And cool. That's fine. That's business models or business models, but I don't want to do that. Like I have yeah. my tools. I want to use the tools that I like. Um, and so, so I am very excited to see what you're building. And I think that might be a good, uh, a good excuse to flip over and, and actually start looking at some code. So let me, yeah, let's do it. Let me close a couple things down here. Cause I was like doing my, my panic, trying to fix my website. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're going to switch over into pair programming view. Here we are. And I need to reload this one as well. Cause it's got the old scene in it. There it is. There it is. That's the right thing. Um, and I'm going to start us off by doing a quick shout out to our captioning. Um, so we have Maggie with us today doing the, the live captioning. That is on learnwithjason.dev at the homepage. You can find those captions there uh, this episode and every episode. Um, and I actually, I got a hint that I might be able to embed these directly into Twitch so that the closed caption button works. And I haven't had time to explore it yet, but I think so. Twee, thank you for helping me dig into that and figure out how it works. I'm really excited to learn. Um, so Maggie is here with white coat captioning. And uh, you, if you if you are doing an event, you can always get white coat captioning. They are the best. Um, that's made possible through the support of our sponsors, Netlify, NX, New Relic, all kicking in to make this show more accessible to more people, which I appreciate very much. And we are talking today to Colby Bayok. Uh, you can find Colby on Twitter, uh, possibly for a limited time. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, I, I think I followed you and Sarah on on there, and I, I literally that was my first real shot. Yeah, on Mastodon, uh, I was going to. But, oh, on Mastodon, we'll yeah. see where that goes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Ma I, I mean Mastodon. I I'm try I'm trying with Mastodon. Like I I do like it. I'm trying to use it. Um, we'll we'll see how that all shakes out. Um, yeah. But all right, so we're talking about Cloudinary today. And so this is the Cloudinary site. It's dropped in the chat. You can check it out. Um, we are going to skip over a lot of the, the onboarding here, but there are good docs. There's good examples. Uh, but today, Colby is going to be our docs and examples. Um, and we are also talking about Next.js. So we're going to be plugging that in and see how that goes. Um, so Colby, what should I do first if I want to uh, start setting this up so do we want to go through the account first or do we want to dive into the code um so like the Let, assumption is let's you have go through the account. account right yeah so okay, cool. I, i've got my i've got my account here um let me pull it off screen because i don't know what's going to show up when i click this open i'm gonna sign in with this one okay so i've got my my cloudinary account here i'm gonna log in and thank you one password all right, so this is my, yeah, okay, that's, that's the public one. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. 
but yeah, so this is my uh, this is my my Cloudinary account. I have a whole bunch of stuff going on. You can see here that um, you know I use this for a whole bunch of stuff. I've got tons of things in here, um, and this is my media library that's just full of things. I have uh, I have tons and tons and tons of stuff in here, including all of my Learn with Jason stuff. And so you can see here my my templates, and then. Um, a bunch of miscellaneous assets and you know once upon a time we had ben host the show so i had an alternative uh alternative thumbnail mm -hmm. there and just a lot of stuff like that right that uh, these are all the the things from my blog um so I use it for everything like it's it is in heavy rotation in my my universe here um and i would imagine most of this stuff is being programmatically uploaded right almost all of it yeah yeah. So I, th I think an interesting thing is like a lot of people might not ever even see the media library, right? Because if mm -hmm. they're just using it on the back end, they might just be doing this all from the code. So um, this is the media library is really great. You know, of course, it's where you can visit your photos, your videos or whatever. But um, this plays even more interesting into like creatives where they're just like uploading these things unless you have that automated as well. But mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, a lot of cool things you can do inside here as well. Absolutely. Um, so what do you, is there anything you want to dig into specifically in here? So the, we have kind of two options for how we can use the, uh, the component. So, uh, by default, it'll request, it'll expect a public ID. So that'll be, if you're in, if you're looking at one of your assets, uh, it'll be that little ID at the top, uh, including the directory structure. Um, so if we're looking at that very first one or second one, uh, learn with Jason, uh, OG 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's your public ID and in your instance, it'll be the full thing with the LWJ. Uh, mm -hmm. then that public ID as the full thing. Right. Right. Um, so by I... default, it'll take that as the source. Yes. And so I, so if we look at this, um, this is my cloud name, right? Yep. And so you then, have the cloud name, then you have your asset type, then you have the, uh, delivery type, which, uh, so you uploaded that as opposed mm -hmm. to our fetch API, which is the other way that I was, um, where we can set the delivery type to fetch. And what it will do if you pass in a URL as that public ID, mm -hmm. Cloudinary will fetch that from the remote URL cache it uh, and do whatever else as if it was on its own platform. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier if you still want to control all your source assets or if it's coming right. from CMS. Um, you just have a little bit more flexibility from that, though you don't get some of the features um, like background removal you can't use on on, uh, on the fly background removal. Um, sure, so it's sure, sure. Ever so slightly limited, but um, for the most part, for most use cases, it, it works just the same and it's really uh, a nice way to go about it. Right. And then we've got this this version, um, which this is actually optional, right? Like you can leave that out. Yeah, the version is optional. And then the folder that I put it in and the name of the thing and then the the content type. Yeah, and the content type's actually optional as well. Um, oh, it is? Mm -hmm. So the public, I so that kind of gets stripped along with the public ID. Ah, uh, cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then, so yeah, I mean, I guess we can dissect the image format a little bit. So um, let's do it. What you're looking at in the URL is the API. The URL is the API. And part of what we're doing, what the SDKs are doing, are all doing the same thing, where we're constructing that URL and ultimately adding parameters for any transformations or optimizations that we want to do. So it makes it a nice way to, like, you can literally just build your own API with just a URL if you want. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we recommend the SDKs. But if you want to, you can just simply chop up the URL and serve it as you'd like. This is actually something that I've, um, I, I do a lot of the same transformation. So I end up kind of doing them over and over again. Um, I, I can, uh, so like, I'll show you the one that I do all the time. So people ask me for a headshot because I'm going to speak at something or, or whatever. And so I come here and then I've got this image that I, um, this is full size, but like this image is huge because I don't know mm -hmm. if people are going to do like a brochure or like a printed material. So I want them to have access to a bigger version. Um, but this is absurd to send to somebody. Plus they want a headshot. Like they want like this section, not the full image. And I don't want them to have to do that on their own. So I do a couple things here. Um, so I, I start out by doing, um, Q auto, right? So that automatically sets the, the quality. And actually we should, we should look at this in the network because I feel like this makes such a big difference. Um, oh, yeah. so if we do this, this is a five megabyte image. 
that we're delivering right now. Um, and it is a JPEG. So we can see it's being delivered as image JPEG. So then the, the first thing that I do whenever I have an image is I add the Q underscore auto and the F underscore auto. So the Q is for quality, the F is for format. And yep. as soon as you hit that button, um, a couple good things happen. So first and foremost, if it loads, oh no, internet, are you gonna so the, be, you gonna betray so me? So the right first now? time, it's it's a pretty big image, right? So the first time, it might take an extra second um, to process it on the fly, but then it's cached, and then from there, so like if you refresh, it'll serve really fast. So um, a couple things just happened. First and foremost, this is now two point three megabytes, so less than half of the original size, but it's still that big old image. So that part is amazing. And then if we look under the hood here, now it's a WebP. So. I didn't have to do anything. I just was like, hey, Cloudinary, make it better. And it just made it better. Um, what browser are you in? This is Edge. OK. Uh, I don't think I have the Avif flag turned on. I was I was wondering about that. So another interesting caveat to the to the uh, to that. So it usually will ser serve Avif if it's supported. Mm. However, it also tries to determine what is the most efficient. So there are some use cases where uh, WebP will beat out um, AVIF in like the, the efficiency factors. So if that's it. the case, it will still serve the WebP, but you know, usually it's gonna be AVIF. Nice. So then the next thing that I would do from here is I want this to be way smaller. So like a lot of conferences are gonna want this to be like 500 pixels square. So I can do W underscore for width and H underscore for height and make it square. Okay. Um, and so it's going to do the processing for me and then, ah, oh crap, it squished my head. Uh, <laughs> but because Cloudinary is smart, I can do a uh, crop of thumb. And now it does the, the magic again. And because I said thumbnail, it's cropping the image now and it does it like this. Uh, but I want it to be my face so I can do gravity of faces, right? And yep. that will then say, hey, Cloudinary, find my face. Okay, but that's a little too close. I don't want it to be that close. So I'm going to adjust the zoom so I can do Z underscore 0 0.75. I actually didn't know you could do that. So and July, look at this. Today I learned. So now I have, I have built out a, like without changing the source image, I've been able to change from a five megabit image that somebody would have needed to pull into Photoshop and edit down and turn into like whatever format they needed and crop appropriately. I've now delivered a, a 500 by 500 image that is the right aspect ratio and the right like crop for them to use. And it's also now 25.7 kilobytes. And again, served as a WebP. So this, this is why I feel like this tool is such a game changer is I can, if I want any, any image of mine to do this, I can like just copy this section out, right? So let me just copy this and then let's go back here and let's find another image. And now I've got the same image. This is another giant image. And this one is 5.2 megabytes. Now I'm going to go in right here and just paste in the same thing. What did I do? Oh, I did it. I, I put it in the wrong place. The wrong spot, yeah. Um, so let me grab that back out. And we'll put it after the upload. That's where it's supposed to be. And so I, I'm now able to do exactly the same thing with, you know, I like I don't have to go and manually do these crops, right? This This is why this is so freaking cool. Um, and, and why I lean on it so heavily is like, I only, and once I've solved the problem once, it's kind of just like solved forever. Um, Absolutely. and you know, there, there's a couple things that you do have to do. Like, uh, I noticed that when I, when I uploaded mine, um, if I go, where do I keep these? These are my headshots. I think, um, press. Yeah. Press. Okay. So if I go under press. And I find one of these photos. I've got all my my old uh, all my old photos here. So I find one of these, and I'm like, "This is this is great. This is what I want." But it's not finding my face. Then you can go in under. Is it under here where you choose the faces? 
I didn't know that you could do this. You're you're yeah. teaching me stuff. <laughs> so there's a there's a bunch of stuff <laughs> that I that I do on these that um that is really really useful. So I want to edit contextual metadata. No, nope, that's not it. Oh, no, did it move? Tag, move to folder, add to collection. It's in here somewhere. Um, I want to analysis, auto tagging, face detection. And then if I want to like add an area of interest, you can, um, you can add one of those. And so like, I can do something like, I think it's already got this because it's area of interest. I want it to show. So and it looks you, like, oh, the, okay, that's just showing the face. It's got the face, and then uh, it lets me kind of put those in. But so, anyways, I'm I'm uh, I'm kind of yeah. flying around this pretty fast. But like, if I if it didn't find my face, I can go in and draw a square, mark it as an area of interest, and it will it will then find that face, right? So just little stuff like this that it's so convenient, and it's you know it's all kind of buried in in context menus and stuff because power powerful tools end up being that way. But mm -hmm. what a what a like game changer for me that I don't have to ever open up Photoshop to fix one of my own photos. I can just upload them here at full res because if I ever do, you know, like somebody notices that, that there was somebody's like, Ooh, we should write an article about you in a magazine. Then I have magazine resolution. But since seeing as that hasn't happened, I crop it down for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> No, totally. And like, I'm the, the interesting thing is thinking about this in another context, right? Like I, e-commerce is my favorite. It, it's actually like the biggest use case. Um, but it's one of my favorite use cases as well as imagining like an online store where you have the photographers uploading the image, you have the product managers adding the products, but you have no idea what any of those sizes are going to be. And that could change all the time, right? Like if you're doing AB testing or if you're doing a new redesign, you don't want to constantly have to have people cut up all these different sizes or mm -hmm. you know, do that yourself. So being able to have this ability to do it programmatically have it able to go to the subject so you're doing faces you can do g auto and it'll automatically detect the subject so that would be mm. like you in its entirety right um so there's different options that you can pass in for that gravity value which right. is basically the anchor point um to do that automatically well and that's so uh i don't remember exactly how i did it on these but like this is a cropped and resized version of that full size photo and then this is also a cropped and resized version of that photo with a different, like, I think this is a thumbnail gravity and this one's kind of like just a regular old square crop. Um, and that way, like these photos, when you're looking at them small, like this would be kind of hard to tell what's going on if you, if you saw this at this size. So by being able to do the crop, I can kind of show the area of interest in the photo. And then there's more to it when you, when you actually click through. And I feel like that, like just little stuff like that, that I can do programmatically instead of having to manage different size thumbnail assets and stuff like that has made such a big difference in my ability to make the interfaces of, of things that I'm building feel good. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so that's, that's kind of the, that, that's why I reach for Cloudinary when I need to put assets onto a website is, is because of what it allows me to do here. Um, and then like we talked about, it's, it has historically been more difficult to do that with Next.js because they're trying to push you toward their image processing service and, and component. Um, so if I want to, if I want to set one of these up, like, should I just start a new next project to get us going? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. I mean, you, you have a ton of, uh, cloudinary assets already. So yeah, uh, let's just do a create next app. All right. I'm going to get us to the, uh, yeah, we'll create next app. And that is gonna live in, uh, we're gonna go cloud and nary next JS. And that's gonna drop us in, yeah, we'll use TypeScript. And while you're working through this, a quick tip, I don't know if you know that you can do named transformations. So if you find yourself doing those same transformations Ooh. all the time, you can predefine those. That's nice. I should yeah. do that, that would be, that would that would actually save me a ton of time. Um, okay, so we're in here. I'm gonna get init so that cool. VS Code doesn't yell at me, and then we're gonna pop this thing open. Um, we've got our node modules. We've got pages public, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just gonna start this thing up in uh, in Netlify Dev mode. 
So that's going to, you know, it auto detects that it's the next site. So it's going to grab all the things that we need and it'll open it up so that we got ourselves a site. Yay. So I'm going to hop in here and probably just delete everything, right? Like, do we need? Yeah. Um, like we don't really need any of that stuff. Um, all right. So let's just kind of clear this out. We don't need a footer. Um, and we don't really need put one of these in here and maybe, maybe do something like that later. But for now, actually, I'm just going to leave that stuff out entirely. We don't need it. So, all right, cool. We now have Perfect. our, our very basic site. And if I were to, uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do this the way that I would, Kind of start by doing this. So let's let's say I'm going to make a website for myself. I'm going to start with this image right here. And so my first instinct would be go with an image, right? And then I'm going to add alt, and then I'm done. So I'm going to come back out here, and that does work. We've got the the image on the page, but next is already pissed at me because it's like <laughs> you got to use the image element, right? Um, of course. And while it will let me build it here, if I actually try to deploy, this is going to fail my deploy, which is probably the most irritating thing about Next.js. <laughs> so irritating. So irritating. I don't know why they don't like automate it in the build. I'm, I'm sure there's a technical reason, but oh. Or just like don't fail. Just put print warnings and don't fail the build. Like what a yeah. what an odd that, what an yeah. odd hill to die on. Um, well, one thing I remember, like Gatsby. Uh, this is getting into the difference between the frameworks, of course. But like I remember Gatsby. Um, they gave you in dev mode they'd give you the lint warnings right like mm -hmm. i i never understood why next.js didn't do that same thing and uh, they but... they so they're linting but this is this is a warning but then they fail it, instead of marking it as an error that will fail your build it's a warning that fails your build which feels counterintuitive anyways es lint is definitely a rabbit hole that's uh that is deep and <laughs> probably not what we want to talk about today so uh, yeah. um yeah but so according to es lint what i need to do is go use next image but if I try to use next image, it's going to fight me on using my cloudinary stuff. So I instead want to use your library, which I would get from yes, yes. where? So the library is next hyphen cloudinary. Uh, we can pull it up uh, if you want. So it's next hyphen cloud cloudinary dot space jelly dot dev. Okay, so, so here this is, is uh, the, doc the site. tool. All right, so here's the doc site. We got, oh, nice, I'm already So this excited. is just an example that I put together that kind of shows the flexibility of it. Um, there's a couple of just different interesting things going on in this image, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we're doing that cropping, like you were talking about, where we're automatically cropping to uh, the person in there. We're doing mm -hmm. background removal, uh, mm -hmm. then we're putting an image underneath. I'm also changing the color a little bit to, to make it look a little bit more like it's uh, part of the background and then adding text on top. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a ton of things that we're doing all within that scope of that uh, component. That's yeah, there's, a, and this is, I mean, this is, again, this is one of the things that I love is this was all done with code. You just kind of tell yeah. Cloudinary to do the thing. This would have taken me forever in Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But so, okay, so I want to use this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop over here and this is what I want. Nope. Like I guess this. I should probably make those two separate uh, code blocks. Nah, right? nah, that's just me not knowing how, uh, not knowing how to use a mouse. So I'm going to NPM install Next.js Cloudinary. And uh, all right, so start this up again now what am i uh before you start it up there's uh you just want to do one thing and add an environment variable um so we need to know where to access your cloud name so the oh, only gotcha. thing we need to do is add a cloud uh next public cloudinary cloud name environment variable okay so i'm gonna uh i'm actually gonna do i i just i want to be able to deploy this without having to set up the environment variables twice so i'm going to deploy yeah. first and then we'll just kind of keep this thing going so I've got everything in here. I'm going to git commit uh, m, and we're going to say work in progress. Uh, first deploy, right? So then I need to GitHub repo create, and I want to push this repo. Um, I'm going to call it 
if you add the org name, it'll create it in your org, I found out. So you can just copy paste oh. this in here. That's and cool. I'm going to make it public. I do want a remote, and I do want to push everything that's here up to that remote. So then, uh, because I'm in um, terminal, iterm, I can just click this, uh, and it'll take me to this old, this old buddy. Um, so now this is running. So I can go to app.netlify.com, and I want to set up a new site. So we're going to import an existing project. We'll go to GitHub. Um, don't need Netlify because it's on the Learn Adjacent org. I'm laughing because I saw your little GIF, your organization GIF. I didn't know you could send GIFs. That was amazing. <laughs> Cloudinary next. There it is. All right. I don't need to configure anything, so I'm just going to deploy the site. And then I'm going to go into the site settings, and I there's this ID here. So I'm going to copy that, and then I'm going to Netlify link. Oops. I did mean link. Oh, nice. And I'm going to enter the site ID because that's nice and fast. And now my site is linked. Okay. I feel like so, most of the time when it says, did you mean, it doesn't give the ability to correct it. So that was nice. <laughs> I don't know who added that, but that's such a game changer for me. Like, because yeah. I do this all the time. Um, but, uh, okay. So now what I can do is I can set environment variables using uh, Netlify and set. And then what is the variable that we need? Cool. So it's next underscore public underscore cloudinary underscore cloud underscore name. Or you can just copy and paste it from the documentation. Let's do one of these. And my cloud name is Jay Langsdorf. So I'm going to set that. Okay. So that's now set. So when I run Netlify dev, it's going to um, grab this environment variable. But importantly, this environment variable is now also available to deploys. Mm. Um, and so that, that is a, uh, kind of, a, that's nice. A, a, that was a big deal. Um, and so the way that this works, if you're in the, the new experiences, it, it shows, this is what we just created. Um, but if I needed to, and since this is just the cloud name, I'm going to show it, you can see the values here, but if I wanted it to work differently on local dev and then like have a production cloud, I could also edit these values so that you can, um, you can keep them like separate for local staging production, et cetera. That's super um, handy. And if you want to do, there's there's more. I'm not going to talk about that today. There's a lot there. It's worth <laughs> checking out. It's uh, it's a very cool, that's like, it's new. We haven't talked about it a bunch, but I'm, I'm really yeah. excited about it. It's solved some big problems for me. That's awesome. All right. So environment variable set. We're back up and running. Yes. I've got the, I've got it installed. I'm gonna... So let's import it. All so right. import, and we're going to destructure CLD image, capital C, capital I, uh, from Nextcloudinary. Like that. Um, and at this point, you should be able to just uh, swap the image tag. The only thing I think you'll require a width and a height um, for it to actually work. I think those are the only other two attributes that are required. Okay, and we made this um, square. And I, and I think technically it'll take in the Cloudinary URL. It tries to parse it, but it doesn't. it's not always able to. Um, so we can see if it works first. Let's see here. Doesn't yeah. like it. So uh, what we'll want to do is just uh, take the URL and just only apply the cloud name. Or I'm sorry, the public ID. Um, so cut off everything until I think the upload parameter. Or no, to press. Sorry, forgot you had the parameters in there. Like that? Yeah, and I had to get rid of the first trailing or the first slash as well. Yeah, there we go. Yay. Okay, so uh, we've but, we've eliminated uh, all right. of my uh, my optimization. So this is now a a big old image. <laughs> and one thing to clarify: so you set it as a square, but the image isn't a square, right? So mm -hmm. that's why we're seeing it a little bit warped, right? Um, but we can fix that super easily, right? So um, now, since we have the crop based API, we can add, or crop based API, the props based API, uh, we can add a prop of crop. And we can set that to fill or thumb if you prefer. Okay. And that should be able to reload. Um, if you wait a second, I think it will reload in the background after it the did. image is actually downloaded, um, but it won't do it until that. But as we can see, uh, it was already updated. Um, 
by default, it uses G auto or a gravity of auto. So it'll mm. automatically uh, set that crop to the uh, to the subject. Um, so you don't, you don't usually need to do all those things, but you could set it as faces. You might get a little bit different of a result since you might want it to specifically look for a face. Got it. Nice. Why is this yelling at me? Yeah. Could not find a declaration file. Oh, so it's... I haven't gone into TypeScript yet. Got I, it. Every, like, I know I need to do it. It's um, all good. But uh, yeah, I haven't learned it yet, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, cool. um, if I, so I'm, I'm a, do I have a zoom property as well? Or is there a way to just kind of add a, a arbitrary transformations? So that you can do, uh, I set it up as a fallback to do raw transformations. Cause I don't, I've been manually adding the different qualifiers. Cause I didn't want to just plaster every single one in there. I wanted to make them. Oh, that's um, not it. So yeah, it'll be an array. Uh, and an array of strings so yeah that should work like that okay so we'll give that a second there it goes uh i so probably the only need to change the gravity that, yeah and the only thing with the zoom i think the zoom might have to be coupled to the um to the primary transformation so when you're doing the different transformations you have the different blocks I guess my hand should be angled the other way. Um, <laughs> you have the different blocks of the transformations. And when you have that chain, the way that you had it in the original URL, right. the zoom was applying to that transformation. It so was, yeah. the way that it's set up now is that zoom is happening after that transformation. So I don't oh. think that that's going to. So, I mean, what you could do is pass in all those, but what I need to do is add the zoom prop so that it would attribute it to the, um, to the actual thing. So what I would need to do in the meantime is, is kind of one of these. Uh, it should be one uh, one full string, but yeah. Oh, I got it. I'm making a note that I need to add that. Make one of these. Did it do the thing, or did I? So let's look at the the source URL. And it is saying, just open one up here. So I wonder if the, so the crop probably needs to be along with the width and height as well. So what you need to do is add the width and the height to the, to that raw transformation string. Oh, I gotcha. So this is partly why I was excited to come on because you're going to help me find the holes in this. <laughs> Um, okay, here we go. So this is, this is getting us where we want to go. Right. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, we, we're getting, we're getting all these details. It's, it's pulling everything together for us and I can kind of start to figure out where, where we want this to go. So it, it actually looks like because we've added other things to it, we might not need this piece. Cause you updated it to faces, right? I yeah. did update it to faces. Um, you know, that's, that's going to be fine for now. Right. So this is, this is kind of doing, it's doing the thing, um, doing the thing. So, th I mean, this is, but this is great. So let's, let's do it with, uh, with one where we can like drop the, the background out and do, do some different stuff. So let's, yeah, that let's good. go grab, um, where's one that's going to be easy to crop. Uh, here's this one looks like it might be good, right? Yeah, that should be good. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to take. Just, so you can probably just copy the ID in the top, yeah. Yeah. So let's go in here. And I'm going to drop this piece in. And what's the 6400 by 4267? Yeah. So one interesting thing is, so if you're not doing the, um, what I usually set up these images, I add the, resp the responsive sizing. And when you use the responsive sizing, you don't really need to worry about the sizing, just making sure that it has the right ratio. Okay. Uh, because at that point, the responsive sizing controls what those width and heights are going to be. How um, does, but, how does yeah, one turn on the responsive sizing? Uh, so you use the sizes uh, attribute and um, we can just set it lazily right now to like 100 viewport width. Um, and that should just, give you some i think you also need your width and height in there just to be clear okay, um, but so what i what i meant was you don't need to have the specific width and height of the 
uh, of the image. Like it can be just something that's going to express the ratio of that image. Oh, I got you. I got you. So we can set the, uh, what was it? 6,200 by something absurd. 6,400 by 4,267. 4,267. Okay, back to here. And so now if we inspect that image, now it, the image is blowing up out of its container. Um, but if we look at that, we see all those responsive sizes now, right? And those mm -hmm. are all being uh, added by Cloudinary. Now, the Next.js image component is what's doing that logic to generate all those sizes, mm -hmm. but then it plugs it into that to the Cloudinary URL. Nice. But it works okay. really well. That's great. Um, and so I I would then need to um, add some some styling here to like... Yeah. So one thing that's interesting, uh, if you just go to like your global file, what I usually do is add like a max width of 100% and set the height to auto. Um, of course, oh, I'm sure you. that has some uh, implications that I don't think about, but that usually serves me pretty well. It'll be fine. Uh, oh, yeah. Thanks. Nah. I usually do max with 100%, so it's not the container. Yeah. There we go. All right, so we've we have overridden the thing, and it's now showing us uh, a max width of 100%, so it's the container, not the viewport width. That was a good call. And then the height auto just overrides so that the aspect ratio is is defaulted. Um, cool. Cool. Okay. Feeling so good did we want to crop that again, or do you want to just remove the background right away? You tell me. I will, uh, let's let's show off what... Uh, let's what... just remove the background. Yeah. All right, cool. So let's add the prop is remove background camel case. Like that? Yep. Um, just you don't need to add a value. You could add true if you want, but it's just uh, just the prop itself. Um, now, what's going to happen in the background is if you go back to your console, if you still have that open, um, you can probably refresh uh, and see this as well. But we see that we're getting a why a four twenty. Can you uh, open that up and we can see? So here's a trick if you haven't heard of it before. If you look in your request he uh, request headers. Um, or response headers rather, CLD is going to return a header that gives you the error. So we can see CLD error. You don't have an active subscription. So that's right. So you, it requires the AI, uh, the Cloudinary AI background removal add-on. So let's okay. add the add-on. Okay. I forgot about that bit. And I would get um, so that. So the add-ons, yeah. So the add-ons are going to be that little puzzle piece up there. Okay. And then it's going to be that top left one. Yep. Um, and there's a nice little free tier for us to play around with. But you can go ahead and click that. I have successfully oh, subscribed. Yay. So maybe cached. That's the only thing from here. We could probably add a version to avoid that or just switch to a different image. I haven't tried adding the version that way. So let's see if that works. Let's see. I think you got to do it um, with these. You have to use an actual version or it gets all grumpy. Let's see how this one works. It usually does a pretty good job with uh, the background removal. Um, I've I've actually been using, I built like a little photo booth app that I've been taking to events and it's it does a really good job at removing the background, like even with a ton of people in the background. Um, so it's been neat to see. Okay, so now, okay, so now we have that 423. So what's happening is the the processing for the background removal is asynchronous. Now, it can take a really long time or it can take a really short time, um, but it doesn't know that right away. So rather than just having that image hang and hang and hang in the mm. background, it's going to return that 423, which means that it's processing. Now, after it processes, it's, not, it's going to cache that and serve it as is from there on out. So it's not like this is going to happen every single time. But got you got to get that first load to happen first before it can actually remove the background. So uh, we'll probably have to wait a few seconds. I think it was a, a decently big image, like right? Five so it might take a few image seconds. or something. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll probably take. Is a it going to auto reload once it's done? It's not. That's something that I that somebody's working on a pull request for, or I'll eventually have to uh, do myself because now there's an on error attribute in Next.js. So what I want to do is pull for that uh, for the asset after uh, that error message occurs, and once it's loaded, just swap that in. Nice, nice. Um, and so, it's... Um, but in the meantime, like we can remove that since we know that that's getting removed in the background. We could always mm -hmm. do something else, or we can, um, yeah, yeah. Let's let's leave it off for now. We'll add it back. 
So let's go over that, to the uh, the documentation. We can look at some of the different examples of the props that we can work with. Great. Um, here. Yeah. So if we go to under the left sidebar under examples. So there's a lot of different things we can do. The zoom and pan one is fun because, uh, you know, like the Ken Burns effect where like it takes a still image and it kind of can move around. Mm -hmm. uh, this is is that. So by default, it's just going to use Gravity of Auto again and zoom into the subject. But um, what you can do is you can set all your different coordinates, whether you want to zoom to or from. Um, a lot of different things are how you can do that. I think you probably want loop, yeah. And this will take a second to load the first time as well, since it's processing that in the background. Oh, um, I gotcha. Okay, so we got the zoom pan. Ooh, pixelate. That's fun. Yeah. But this image is way too big for what we're trying to do with it. I know. I know. Okay, <laughs> let's let's go get a smaller image. Like this is gonna kill us. Um, I have I have some stuff that is not quite so absurdly large. Um, let's go with one of these and here we go. This one's, this is a small image, 60 kilobytes. That should be fine. So let's, okay. that's in LWJ. Okay. All right. Let's try this again. And didn't like it that time, but it'll like it this time. It won't like yeah, it let's anytime. See the network What's going on? Oh, here it is. Oh, there here we is. go. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. But now yeah. that it's processed, like if you reload the page, it's going to be served cache on the CDN. So yeah, it's super it'll nice. load right away. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I have it so that uh, for F auto, not only can you have it do F auto for anything, but if you do F auto, I think it's colon animated. I'd, I'd have to double check on that. You can set it so that it'll automatically determine the best animated format to serve, which is interesting. Oh, that's nice. Um, oh, this is cool. Yeah, grayscale, you can do tints, cropping, it's got the auto gravity, thumb on faces. So placeholders are interesting. I need to figure out how to better show those in the documentation, but those really only are only going to show. Those are the uh, the blurred placeholders, um, like the really oh, tiny yeah, placeholders. Yeah, yeah. These are, I mean, these are cool though. Like uh, placeholder, yeah. uh, we'll go with blur and then I'm gonna switch this out. Uh, let's save it. So I think it's just loading so fast that you're not even gonna see it. Yeah, let's maybe, let's maybe turn on the, the throttling. We'll go with a, a slow 3G, make this just a little bit taller here so that we can see what's going on. Um, So this is 3G performance. So we got to download the markup and then we got to download all the JSON and then we got to bootstrap uh, that JavaScript and then we got to rehydrate the page and then we get stuff. What's, why is this so big? Yeah, that's a good question. What on earth is causing this? That seems like too much stuff. Maybe we try that again. Whoa. That is a decent amount. All right, next, maybe you need fast 3G. Do you have to refresh after that? Or will it just automatically I update? I think so, I think it just, yeah. Oh, that's cool, I didn't know that. Jeez, that is brutal, <laughs> holy crap. Okay, let's try that one more time. My goodness. Oh, and it's it still, still, it's still too fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back to um, the big image, right? No. But. Yeah. All right. Uh, no, this is good. This is great. So um, I wonder if that like preloaded in the background because the, the next step was taking so long. Um, mm. Anyways, placeholders are cool. You should, yeah. you should consider using them. Uh, let's see if it'll show up. Oh, there it is. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. So you can see the flicker of it. 
yeah you kind of get like so it's that. just a so by default next like next has has its own by default but what i wanted to do was try to provide some kind of variation on top of it and mm -hmm. um, i don't know there's only so much you're able to do because it actually uh next js is blurring it in the dom or at least they were in next 12 i didn't check in 13 um so like i what i wanted to do is create those uh svg placeholders which yeah. i don't it's not my favorite thing but i wanted to provide that option mm -hmm. um and i couldn't do that because of the blurring that was happening got it got it got it yeah um so they're still still very cool lots you can get away yeah. with here um so let's let's do this i want to kind of you you did this cool thing where you we replaced the background on this so let's let's remove the background here um remove background this isn't going to work, is it? Because it's like a there. super weird thing to remove a background. I'm with. curious to see what it looks like. Yeah. All right. Let's it try. It does work with text. Yeah. I have, I have my suspicions that this is going to go strangely. <laughs> or the best way. <laughs> I don't know how long to expect this to take. Yeah, I'd say probably ten to twenty seconds. Okay. Usually for smaller images. Maybe we can find something um, less. Do we have anything in here that looks like a good? A Maybe good by the room? time you find it, it'll probably be done. <laughs> yeah, I think you're probably right. Those are all videos. Fun fact, though, you can also do background removal with videos. Can you really? I took that Shia LaBeouf video and I the green screen one, and it was a yeah, it was a lot of fun. Amazing. Um, so these are all. God, I'm not gonna mess with guests. Let's uh, let's do. You can mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd have to. Have I not? Okay, let's find. Let's find you. Oh crap! They've all got custom names, don't they? Mm. It's like upload asset names. Yeah. Crap. So this is. Let's see if like... it's. Let's see if it's done. Maybe it. There, yeah, it is. there we go. It's all not right, perfect, but uh, we results. see the point, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and if we if we move this around, you can kind of see like where where the background is on it. Um, and if I change this to, let's replace this background. Uh, is it here? Background. We'll make it like red, and you can really yeah. see what's going on. Like just pure chaos. <laughs> yeah. So that, like this this uh, and just like to clarify for the like this isn't the intent of removing backgrounds, right? So this is like yeah. a tricky one, but um, like it's it's helpful for our for our example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've uh, we've got that, and then um, I should have somewhere in here. I feel like we want. Where's my in my media library? I have all this these images that I've done at different points that is this one smaller? Here's a much smaller version of Let's me try it, that yeah. we can mess with. Um, so this one is just in slash Jason, they have slash Jason BG. Okay. All right. So this is a smaller image that should theoretically uh, 20 seconds or so be usable yeah. with the the background knocked out so that will you know we'll, we'll see how it, it's got a lot of different things going here so um you know we'll see but i'm confident in it then we can try to put something else in the background i'm sure where I've are got, we putting you i want to be hanging out oh that's an animated gif never mind um i wonder if that would work actually but yeah let's have me hang out with myself tried putting a gif as a background <laughs> just hang out with myself that seems good so we'll uh we'll do we'll do that so i've got another image here that we can use and that's going to be at here all right so i've got my my cloud name is ready if i want to put a new background in after i remove the background what what do i do so we're going to use something called underlays and i uh Typically, you can create like an underlays property and do an array with objects, but I created like a helper way to just do it really quickly. So you can okay. use the underlay like you have there. Um, and we can just set a string and we can pass in the public ID and that should be it. Oh, really? That's easier than I expected. Okay, so we're yeah. going to drop this in there. And let's see if it's done. It is. 
Look at it go. Look how cool that is. I, I like that I... You're I, covering up Marissa, though. Yeah, so covering up Marissa and not with me, Jason. which is much funnier. <laughs> <laughs> But so this is great and like this is this is one image and i think that's the part that's really cool is if we we open the image in a new tab um this is this is not like multiple images this is this is very much uh like one specific image uh the cloud yeah, URLs, so it, twitch fights them so the i think the interesting thing like thinking about photoshop since you know most people have a basic idea of how photoshop works uh, i would imagine um is like you have your layers right um what we're doing is we're taking that base image of you that's going to be our base layer and we have our underlay which is mm -hmm. basically shoving something underneath right and that's going to be that uh that background image now there's also the overlays which is more commonly seen is where you add the text and you add the other things and those are going to be your layers on top mm. okay let's let's do one of those that sounds fun yeah is it just the same thing so yeah, so um, I think you need to, I don't think I have a helper method with that for, for that one. So I think you need to define, so we have two different things. You could do text, which is just the text prop, um, and then you can add a string. So let's just try that first and we can start playing around with that. Um, and then you can add something. Yeah. <laughs> so by default, it's going to be like just black text, like very simple, just shoved on there um, as an easy way if you want to add text in the middle of the image, right? Right. Um, but of course, not everybody wants to do it that way. Um, and for this, I'm probably going to have to ask you to copy and paste out the documentation because I don't know okay. the exact uh, things for you to do. Um, but you can under, if you go all the way down on the left, uh, I'm sorry, on the sidebar, um, and then do text overlays. You should be able to just copy one of the text objects. Uh, you can just, so I have that in the overlays format. I guess I didn't update it because it's a little bit more complicated, um, but you could just copy all the information inside of that text object if you wanted to. Like this? Yeah. And then, so instead of instead of this, then I would do... Exactly. Got it. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Good, good, good. Um, and then we can just start bold underline letter spacing. Can I set so a I border? Like one, one of the interesting things for me is like some of the stuff we were doing before isn't as visually exciting, but it's very practical, right? Where I, this is more of the fun stuff, like being able to actually see the visual impact of add like the text and the different images and uh, playing with those different layers. Right. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, what if we just want to go full meme format? Like I want to position this toward the bottom and I want to give it a black border. Yeah. How, how would one do such a thing? So now let's break into that actual overlays format. Um, so you can still copy that same object from inside of the text prop, but now, yeah, but now let's add it over an overlays. So um, we're going to create, uh, so create an object first, and then text is going to be at the first property of that object. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Um, so now in addition to that, we want to add a property of uh, position. And that's where we're going to do all of our different coordinates. Um, so you can set the gravity, which uh, if you want that to be on the bottom, you can do the, uh, you can actually just set the gravity. Uh, oh, gravity. So I don't have gravity. to do the thing, yeah. right? Yep, yep. And south. And then uh, if you wanted to add like a Y value, uh, you can certainly do that as well. Okay. And so uh, Y would be like the number of pixels I wanted off the bottom. Yeah, and that's going to be relative, I think, to the original size. So um, depending you know, how much you want to space that out. Yeah, cool. And maybe a little bit more. Let's go like 80. OK, nice. happy. And we're going to do one up top? Uh, sure, yeah, let's do one up top. Cool. So, so yeah, just then you same, can just duplicate same deal that. here. Yeah, so you're just going to add another object to that array, duplicate it. Um, so just a quick uh, note for people watching about gravity. So gravity is going to be that anchor point. Um, 
a lot of the basic examples of gravity are compass directions. So you have north, south, you know, um, those southeast, whatever you want to do. Um, but then we have the AI based ones where we have that auto, we have the faces and all that stuff. So that's kind of what, what you're seeing for those different values. Got it. Okay. So I'm, I'm, and we missing, have our mean. I'm missing a key piece here, which is I need to outline this text or else you can't read it. Let me double check that we have that property. I think you, uh, I feel like I've done this before. Um, is it like cloudinary text in there. stroke or text outline? You can, it's, it's outline. Yeah. Oh, nice. And just... you should be able to, there's just a default option. So if you just pass an outline or wait, no, that's just the, I'm sorry. That's the prop on the actual image itself. Let me find the overlay. Don't tell me I don't have one. Border. It's border. Border. And then do I need to do, can I just do like a border? And you too? also need to do stroke of true. Because it's uh, the difference in what it's trying to do. It's telling it to apply the border as a stroke. Now, for the value of border, um, try something like uh, kind of like CSS, 20 picks underscore solid underscore black, maybe. So what I'm doing here is I'm I'm kind of simplifying the property names, but I'm I haven't yet abstracted the values of it because mm. I'm just leaving it to the original Cloudinary values. Um, so I, I want to think through that a little bit more before I do anything more compl complicated with that. Totally. I, and I think that's the right call, because if you pre abstract some of this stuff, it gets really hard to use. Um, and I can see here that I'm doing something uh, where it's getting clipped, but we're not going to worry about that because it's oh, okay. close enough. And oh, if yeah. I was going to do it for real, I would, uh, I would find another way to solve that problem. Um, but this is fine. It is weird though. I, I think yeah. it's, I think it's like the, I've dealt with this before. There's like a bounding box and you have to set it to be like a hundred percent or something and then make the text, uh, gotcha. centered, gotcha. but yeah, it's, uh, it, this, this is fun. And so now you've got the ability to make a meme thing, right? Like you can go in and just set... with that one component. Yeah. Right. And, and like, what's really fun about this is if you, you can imagine you could make this dynamic, like you could create a meme builder on your site using this component and then like take input from the, uh, from the forms and then drop them in here and you'd be able to generate these memes on the fly. So like, if you wanted to make a meme builder, uh, which we don't have time to do on today, unfortunately, um, this would be like, it's not that wild to imagine that, that you could go in and create this. And I, and I think that's the part that I find so exciting about this is like, I don't want to know. I don't, I don't want to need to know how to open up a canvas element and like build out images and then kind of export those as, as JPEGs. I, I really like the idea of being able to play without having to be a deep expert. Cause like for a meme builder, like, well, uh, also if I'm doing it as a canvas, it's not going to be optimized, right? I'm going to be yeah, doing like yeah. the one format. Whereas with this, I could not only generate the memes on the fly, like let somebody come in, upload an image, then do the meme and then, uh, and then like copy paste it. I could even generate like an image with a source set so that they had all the right versions. So, Hey, do you want to use this meme on your oh, website? Yeah. Copy paste this and it'll be, it'll be performant. Yep. Absolutely. That stuff is incredible. Like what a freaking cool thing that you can do. How yeah, much time do we have left? We got like maybe like five ish minutes before we got to start tearing down. Let's do one more thing. I think we have enough time. All right. I'm ready. Uh, if you scroll down to your imp up to your imports, uh, inside of the code, Let's do CLD, add an additional CLD OG image. Like that. Now copy and paste that image that you have, the, the same image that you have, like just copy and paste that, like the entire thing. Got it. Uh, you can paste it under the head. So it can't be in the head. I can explain in a second, but under the head. Um, now the only thing you need to do is remove the width and the height and the sizes. And of course, update the tag, which you did. Uh, now let's save that. Okay. And now you should be able to inspect your head. And let's see what that does. We get a perfect open graph image. Open graph image. Beautiful. So it uses the same API as the CLD image, but, mm -hmm. um, 
it handles all that work of generating those meta tags so that you can just as easily create your open graph images like you were doing for your site, right? I mean, yeah, this is this is awesome. Uh, I, I think the 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 thing that I always find with these is that it it makes me willing to do some of the work that is important for making websites like first of all performant you know like all the different open graph image sizes and things like that because again if we look at this we're not just generating an image we're generating a full stop helping we have come on get out of the way a full source set here and if you look it's it's the same image many times over but it's got different settings for like the width and stuff like that. So it's showing us that the the rendered size and the intrinsic size and and which current source we're using, but there are a lot of these in here. Um, and I find that really, really cool because we're looking at like, here's the full, full size and then a smaller size and then an even smaller size. So if I open this on a phone, it's probably gonna open the, the 750 uh, mm -hmm. or something like that, which is a much smaller image than, than this full size one that we're looking at right now. Um, and that just happened. Like I didn't have to do it. It just did it for me. And because it's API driven, it all just kind of works on every image. And, you know, I set these sizes up once and then it just happens. Or in this case, I didn't set anything up. I just trust the framework and your, your tool to kind of do that performance optimization for me. Um, but then the other piece of this that I really, really like is that when you start looking at these things, like we just kind of it emerged by playing with this tool that we could make a meme generator. And I would not have thought to tackle that if the tool didn't make it easy. Right. I would yeah. have been like, ah, that's a lot of work for something that already exists. There's already like image flip and meme generator and stuff like that. But it'd be really funny to put one of these on my website. I just wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for the fact that I could like, okay, yeah. Cloud lets me put this in an element. All I have to do is put in a couple form inputs and I'm off to the races. Yeah. I think that that is a that's pretty exciting. Awesome. Yeah, I'm glad that it's uh proving to be some value. I'm excited to hear people's thoughts as they start to dig into it cuz um you know, still trying to uh tell people that it exists. Uh, but if anybody <laughs> does play with it, would love to hear uh love to hear suggestions or feature ideas that you find missing from Cloudinary. Yes. So, chat, go forth and make butt memes. Um <laughs> Colby, this has been great. Where should people go outside of this page here if they want to learn more? Um, outside of that page? Uh, I'm going to tell them to follow I you on you Twitter. Anywhere follow else? Follow me on Twitter. Uh, everywhere at Colby Fayok. Uh, my YouTube channel, Colby uh, at Colby Fayok. Um, Ooh, where okay. I usually put content out about some of the stuff that I create. And I, I think I'll have a tutorial coming out soon, which goes through this more of the basic stuff that we went through, but, um, yeah. Oh, this one. All right. So everybody get in there, get after those, um, discord, which, which discord. So I have my space jelly discord, um, discord, uh, space jelly dot dev slash discord. Um, it's not super, super active, but yeah, I would love for anybody to stop by and say hi. Okay, dropping that one in the chat. Uh, that's going to autocorrect, I assume. Yes, it is. There we go. Um, and with that, I think we're going to call this one a massive success. It was a, uh, you could say, a buttload of success. Um, <laughs> thanks again, as always, to Maggie, who uh, I... <laughs> I'm so sorry, Maggie, Maggie, for making you write this nonsense down. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie's here from White Goat Captioning. Uh <laughs> And that is made possible through the support of our sponsors, Netlify, NX, and New Relic. Um, while you are checking out things on the site, make sure that you go and check out the schedule. We have all sorts of fun things. Um, we are going to do uh, FIDO2, like fingerprint login through your device uh, into, into apps. That's going to be super fun. Shonday's coming back. Uh, we're going to talk about optimizing React performance. Um, Sebastian Lorber is going to teach us about DocuSource 2.0, which I'm very excited about. And then I got a few in the hopper that I have not put up on the site yet. So stay tuned. That's all coming soon. Um, Colby, any, any parting words for everybody before we call this one done? I was really waiting for, to see in the captioning a line from Maggie that says not amused. 
I, you know, I, the consummate professionals, Maggie would never. <laughs> but no, thanks, uh, I, thanks as always for having me. I know she's, she's going to pull a muscle from rolling her eyes so hard. <laughs> Um, all right, so with that, we're going to call this one a success. We're going to go find somebody to uh, to raid. I don't know who's live right now, so I'm going to just start um, start digging and see what we can find. And um, let's uh, let's look at who's who's doing JavaScript right now. We got a few folks doing JavaScript. It looks like Coding Garden is doing Dino and Fresh. That's kind of fun. So let's go raid Coding Garden, Colby. Thank you so much for spending some time today. This was an absolute blast. Thank you. Chat, as always, thanks for spending some time with us. We'll see you all next time. See you later.